We have the good luck this afternoon of hearing from one of Boston College's premier intellectuals, Dr. Sean Copeland, who will speak to us against the backdrop of Boston College's sesquicentennial celebration, which we start this current fall semester. Sean will reflect on a Jesuit university's fundamental concern with the intimate relationship between the human person and the meaning of life, the good life, and eternal life. Dr. Copeland is Associate Professor of Theology in BC's Theology Department and also serves on the program of African and African Diaspora Studies. She received her PhD in the joint Boston College and Over Newton Theological School doctoral program. And before returning here to her alma mater, she taught theology at St. Norbert's College, at Yale Divinity School, and at Marquette University. She has written over 90 articles. Let me say that again. She has written over 90 articles, reviews, and book chapters on freedom, gender, and race and has emerged as a leading voice in scholarly discussions of theological anthropology and political theology. She is also widely recognized as one of the leading voices drawing attention to the concerns of African American Catholics. She is as well former convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium, as well as being former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. In recognition of her important scholarly contributions to the American Catholic Intellectual Project, Sean has received numerous honors and awards. In 2000, she received Barry University's Eve Congar Award for Excellence in Theology. She has also been the recipient of the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Black Religious Scholars Group and the St. Elizabethan Seton Medal from the College of Mount St. Joseph which recognizes distinguished women scholars in theology. Ladies and gentlemen, it does me and the School of Theology and Ministry here at BC great honor to introduce to you the STM's fifth annual anniversary lecture, Dr. Sean Copeland. Good afternoon. <clears throat> a little bit of a, a frog or something here. <clears throat> I want to uh, thank um, Dean Massa for inviting me to give this lecture um, in honor of the anniversary of the School of Theology and Ministry. Melinda Donovan was particularly helpful in keeping the details on track, and for this I'm very grateful. I'm also thankful for the business sense of Maura Kaliri, um, and uh, I appreciate all the questions that Jen Bader answered for me. <clears throat> Finally, uh, I am uh, touched that so many of our colleagues are here this evening, and um, I know that people are busy, and so I appreciate, I appreciate your time. <clears throat> there are uh, two epigraphs uh, for this lecture. The first is attributed to Thomas Aquinas, although we cannot find uh, this in his corpus. Uh, but there are many things attributed to Thomas Aquinas uh, that we cannot find in his corpus. <laughs> uh, the second comes from uh, one of the most distinguished uh, members of the theology department, um, the Jesuit Bernard Lonergan. So the first, our hearts irrigate this earth. We are fields before each other. How can we live in harmony? The ascent of the soul towards God is not merely a private affair, but rather a personal function of an objective common movement in that body of Christ, which takes over and transforms and elevates every aspect of human life. This afternoon, I wish not so much to make an argument as to tell a story, to offer a meditation rather than a set of propositions. This lecture holds no place in our university's distinguished sesquicentennial series, yet that anniversary 
sets one of its coordinates as I hold my alma mater dear. I take as the second coordinate another and forthcoming sesquicentennial, that of the Emancipation Proclamation, for dearer than my university, I hold my people. Because of the historical period in which, uh, because of the historical period in which it was founded, because of the place in which it was founded, the story of Boston College unfolds against the historical, cultural, religious, and social backdrop of the struggle of Irish immigrant and black slave for life, their search for the good life, and their desire for eternal life. In that struggle, that search, and that desire, education was and remains indispensable. In the story I tell, Boston is no insignificant setting. The distinguished jurist and legal scholar Leon Higginbotham concludes that an entry made in 1638 in John Winthrop's journal is the earliest recorded account of black enslavement in New England. Seven years later, Edward Downing, Winthrop's brother-in-law, agitated for the necessity of slave labor. The colony will never thrive, Downing wrote in a letter to Winthrop, until we get a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business. In the beginning of the 18th century, Boston's selectmen were particularly concerned that public officials keep the Indians, Negroes, and mulattoes in good order. Thus, formal codes were introduced to regulate the lives, behavior, and movement of non-whites. These codes covered a range of situations, preventing non-whites from carrying weapons, idling or lurking together in groups of more than two, burying, violating curfew, gambling, visiting free non-whites, and owning hogs. During this period, Bar Boston's merchants grew wealthy on the slave trade and laid the foundations of fortunes even as some colonists, most notably the Puritan missionary John Eliot, protested the buying and selling and ownership of human beings. Yet here in Boston, Crispus Attucks gave his life for the cause of American liberty. David Walker, Sojourner Truth, William Lloyd Garrison, Maria Stewart, and Frederick Douglass denounced slavery and demanded abolition. And from this city, in March of 1863, the all-black 54th Regiment Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, under the command of white Colonel Robert Goulshaw, marched to war. Some commitments to freedom symbolize the desire of the descendants, such commitments to freedom symbolize the desire of the descendants of the enslaved people for life, for the good life, for eternal life. Boston is no insignificant setting. Perhaps now overdetermined by Irish identity, Boston was not always so hospitable to the people of the Isle of Erin. In their history of Boston College, Donovan Dunnigan and Fitzgerald point out that during the decade prior to the American Revolution, Catholics, read Irish, were denied domicile in Boston, and if discovered there, were subject to many legal penalties. Even so, Patrick O'Murphy and John Larkin were among the dozen Irishmen who died at Bunker Hill. Such prejudicial regulations against the Irish continued until the adoption of the state constitution of Massachusetts in 1780. This act removed many restrictions from Catholics, but an oath with an explicitly anti-Catholic clause was still required of all office holders until Massachusetts amended its state constitution in 1822. Then, scarcely a dozen years later, on a hot August evening, incited by lurid rumors of young nuns confined against their will and preyed upon by lecherous priests, an unruly drunken mob shouting anti-Catholic slogans, swarmed and burned the convent of the Ursuline Sisters in Charlestown. By that same year, John McElroy, the future founder of Boston College, had been in the United States for more than three decades. He was not part of the desperate exodus for survival brought on by the potato blight between 1846 and 1851. But when in 1847, as a Jesuit, McElroy came to Boston, he encountered more than 130,000 of his country folk who had come looking for survival, looking for life. John Bernard Fitzpatrick, 
the third bishop of Boston, knew that beyond sheer life, the immigrants must be equipped for the good life. In this, education was key. Boston Irish Catholics were furious at the ridicule and misrepresentation of their religion in public schools. As an, alter an alternative school system became imperative. At the same time, there was a pressing need to educate leaders among the clergy and laity. Fitzpatrick was eager to open a college, but his practical commitment to its realization seems to have surfaced and receded on more than one occasion, perhaps under the pressures of work. On the other hand, McElroy was determined. Despite public discrimination against Catholics, despite reversals of building permits and disputes over land purchase, despite intentional delays and disappointments and recurring opposition, despite the bigotry and intolerance displayed by the city council, McElroy was determined, very determined. On April 7, 1858, ground was broken in the South End on Harrison Avenue for the new Church of the Immaculate Conception. 20 days later, a small group of men, including Bishop Fitzpatrick and Father McElroy, John Williams, the Vicar General of the Diocese, James A. Healy, the Chancellor of the Diocese, and Jesuits John Roden, Bernadette Weigat, and Aloysius Janelich, all gathered without fanfare or publicity to lay the cornerstone of the church. Donovan et al. conclude this ceremony marks the laying of the cornerstone of Boston College. The Chancellor of the Diocese of Boston was an accomplished and talented man, and he was a priest with a secret. The Reverend James Augustine Healy was the son of Michael Morris Healy, an Irish immigrant turned Georgia planter and slaveholder, and his black common law wife and slave, Eliza Clark Healy. How James Healy came to witness the laying the cornerstone of Boston College is part of the extraordinary story of this family, particularly that of the three brothers, James, Patrick, and Sherwood, all priests. Patrick was the Jesuit. The saga of their desire and ability to elude the one-drop rule that made them black lies well beyond the scope of this lecture. Our colleague, historian James O'Toole, has told their story, confronting head-on all its contradictions and paradoxes, and he has told it well. Still, the story of the Healy family uncovers the angular position of the descendants of enslaved Africans in the United States. Consider the framers of the Constitution and their disingenuous intentional non-disclosure of their legitimization of slavery and presumption of black inferiority and white superiority. Consider the custom of partus sequitur ventrum, the child follows the condition of the mother. Thus, no matter how fair the complexion of skin, how fine the texture of hair, how thin the nose and lips, slave status marked all children born to slave women. Consider the fugitive slave law of 1850 that put escaped slaves, free blacks, even in the North, and blacks attempting to pass as white at risk of capture and sale by ordinary white citizens. Consider the legal prohibition to teach slaves to read and write. Consider the legal institutionalization of the cultural transmission and perpetuation of black inferiority even into the 21st century. Our hearts irrigate this earth. We are fields before each other. How can we live in harmony? To apply the metaphor of field to Irish immigrant and black slave may be plausible, but doing so rings with brutality. These were women and men whose bodies were used as ground in which others might plant their pleasure, ground on which others might exact revenge or arrogance, ground on which others might build a fortune. Recall Boston's Back Bay. It stands as a splendid example of 19th century urban design, but the labor to fill in the tidal basin and the fins cost Irishmen their lives. Recall chattel slavery. This was an economic regime in which race made blackness, race made slaves. 
This fiction promoted by religious, political, and economic elites allowed race and racism to coalesce as a powerful and abiding ideology. Our hearts irrigate this earth. We are fields before each other. How can we live in harmony? To apply the metaphor of the field to black slave and Irish immigrant may be plausible, but doing so is ambiguous. The Irish spoke and wrote and sang with rhapsodic pride of the green fields north and south they tilled and cursed yet loved. Black slaves spoke and sang dolefully of the cotton fields they tilled and cursed and despised. Yet for the sake of another universe that neither of these peoples could inhabit, these proud men and women were laborers who fought with hoe and hand against rock and weevil to pull life from bruised and bitter soil. They pinned their hopes on a future life that would not be their own, the future life of their children. Education became a prized route to that future. Hope shaped the life that Irish immigrant and black slaves sought, for neither the system of land tenancy nor chattel slavery destroyed the human spirit. First, that life should fulfill vital needs, food, clothing and shelter, and yes, music and song, tale and poem, riddle and mirth. That life called for a home, an ample place of simple joys, an unguarded smile, a hand held, a cheek caressed, a bruised finger kissed, a quiet, plentiful meal, a comfortable cheer, the warmth of a fire. And home would be more, a place inviolate, a place secure, and above all, a place in which to live and flourish in undiminished dignity. Such active hope for life logically implies community, for when we consider what is so necessary for sustaining human and humane life, the natural sociality of the human person becomes clear. Personal relations of various kinds, acquaintances and partnerships, intimate friendships and marriage, clubs and associations, church and sport, all anchor us as community. Still, community must be achieved. It emerges not from neighborhood proximity, not from regional or national habitation, not even from ethnicity or race merely. Rather, community is realized in sharing and acting upon cherished meanings held in common. So anchored, we may stretch beyond ourselves to and with others in community in action for the sake of the human good. We may call such active stretching virtue. And insofar as virtue is essential to the human good, it is, essential, it is an essential condition for the good life. The good life for which the Irish immigrant yearned and strove was shaped by hope, expressed in creative, active struggle for personal autonomy, security of person, human respect. The good life for which the black slave yearned and strove was shaped by hope expressed in creative, active struggle for freedom and emancipation. As concrete, lived expression of the good life, virtue only looks easy, and especially so when the virtuous person exercises it. Rather, virtue entails intelligently and sensitively figuring out what to do and how to do it and doing it over and over again with ease, with alacrity, even with grace. In the mid-19th century, in so sharply divided a nation, looming civil war put virtue to the test. Irish immigrant and black slave would fight with distinction and honor for the Union and for freedom. But courage rises not only on the battlefield. How should Catholics, how should Irish Catholics think about slavery, abolition, emancipation, and civil war? How should Catholics, how should Irish Catholics act? Catholics in the United States and in Europe differed widely in their opinions on slavery, abolition, and, and emancipation, and war. Boston's Catholics, O'Toole writes, wholeheartedly supported the war 
but theirs was a narrow interpretation of what was at stake. Preservation of the Union, not freedom for the slaves, was their goal. And historian John McGreevy notes that only, quote, a handful of European Catholic theologians criticized slavery in the early 19th century. American Catholics, cleric, lay, and vowed women and men, religious, even the Jesuits of Maryland, owned and sold slaves. Catholic theologians argued masters must permit and respect slave marriages, educate their slaves in the rudiments of the, of the faith, but slavery itself, confirmed by Aristotle and St. Paul, did not violate either the natural law or church teaching. Any shift in the Catholic position on slavery faced formidable obstacles. Rare and vigorous public dissent came from Cincinnati's Archbishop John Purcell and his brother, Father Edward Purcell, editor of the Cincinnati Catholic Telegraph. The Purcells insisted on the moral necessity of emancipation. In one speech, the Archbishop explained why, unlike most Catholics, he would vote the pro-abolition, that is, the Republican ticket. Slavery, he reasoned, was, quote, an unchristian evil opposed to the freedom of mankind and to growth and glory of a Republican country. He continued, the Catholic Church has ever been the friend of human freedom. It was Christ's mission to set men free and Christian people disregard his precepts and principles and examples when they seek to uphold or to, or to perpetuate involuntary human servitude." Close quote. With the eruption of the Civil War, Boston College became the site of the Jesuit scholasticate for 46 scholastics and eight, borders, eight, sorry, eight brothers from across the country, as well as from France, Germany, England, and Ireland. Did this community discuss the war, its causes and effects, or slavery and abolition? Jesuit historian Raymond Schroth thinks not. In his history of the American Jesuits, Schroth records a fragment of a letter written by Father John Babst on March 3, 1861 to a friend. Referring to Abraham Lincoln's approaching inauguration, the rector concluded, quote, we are just at this moment resting upon a volcano, close quote. When the silence on the war in the community was broken, Schroth tells us, it was Bapp's role to restore peace. On McGreevy's account, only one Jesuit, Francis Winninger, publicly defended emancipation, perhaps because he had personally witnessed the horror of a New Orleans slave auction. Certainly, none of the Healy brothers, whose mother was a slave, spoke for emancipation, or publicly protested slavery. If James Healy followed newspaper accounts of Civil War battles keenly and was zealous that Catholic interests be safeguarded during the war, it did nothing, O'Toole observes, to, quote, encourage him to reconsider the distance he had put between himself and African Americans. If anything, it confirmed his self-definition as white different from them, close quote. In his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle denotes courage as a moral virtue essential to the human good. Courage lies in a mean between cowardice as deficiency and rashness or foolhardiness as excess. A courageous person has a proper orientation toward what is shameful and what is fearful. Thus, courage entails grasping what is shameful and what is not, deciding and acting on experiential knowledge and broad understanding of particular situations, as well as acknowledging and facing what induces fear and shame. For Catholics, courage was difficult to discern and even more difficult to exercise with regard to slavery. The blatant discrimination and bigotry Catholics met in America might have made the abolition of slavery an obvious choice. Instead, growing Catholic affluence and influence only generated moral dilemma. Nearly all the bishops of the United States accommodated the custom and culture of slavery. They considered it a social or political question, even as they urged humane treatment of slaves. 
When pressed, the bishops marshaled theological arguments that upheld slavery as consistent with the natural law and sacred scripture, and therefore tolerable, even acceptable. Only with rare exception did clergy and laity dissent from this view. Yet as early as 1843, Daniel O'Connell, Ireland's great champion of liberty, suffrage, and democracy, attacked Irish American, intoler Irish American tolerance of slavery. Few Catholics took membership in abolitionist organizations, and not one prominent American Catholic urged immediate abolition before the Civil War. Did Winninger and Purcell exercise the moral virtue of courage for the human good? Was Bapp's conformity in the silence of the Jesuit community a sign of prudence? Caution for the fragile college in the face of anti-Catholic prejudice? Was the silence of the Healy brothers on race and slavery abolition and emancipation an act of courage, defying and transgressing racial categories, or a successful strategy for personal achievement and individual autonomy? As disappointing as we, and most especially those of us who are Catholic, African American, and Irish, as disappointing as we find the actions of the Healy brothers, their lives exemplified an old black adage they perhaps never had heard. Education is the one thing no one can take from you. In my childhood, this saying had quasi-divine status. Few of those who repeated this adage in the presence of family school children had had benefit of college or university education. Still, they held that education in awe and expected much from those who received it. Like their Irish counterparts, these immigrants from Southern white racist oppression and peonage recognized education as crucial to the human good life. When Father McElroy called for contributions of 25 cents a month to help retire the debt on, fledgling, on our fledgling college, Boston's Irish community responded. They held education in esteem. Perhaps some of them may have been products of the Irish hedge schools. More likely, their parents were. Nonetheless, their aspiration for the good life for their sons was considerable. To greater and lesser extent, the achievement of the good life is governed by historical development, directed by reason, although it cannot evade chance altogether. That life stands as a unique and non-repeatable process for each person and shared by all according to their position and role in the space-time solidarity of humanity. Humble though they were, Irish, Im Irish immigrants sensed, if not understood, the difference between education and information. They would have resonated with John Henry Newman's explanation of the purpose of the Catholic University of Ireland. Our desideratum, Newman wrote, is not the manners and habits of gentlemen, these can be and are acquired in various other ways, by good society, by foreign travel, by the innate grace and dignity of the Catholic mind. But the force, the steadiness, the comprehensiveness, and the versatility of intellect, the command over our own powers, the instinctive just estimate of things as they pass before us, which sometimes indeed, indeed is a natural gift, but commonly is not gained without much effort and the exercise of years. This is the real cultivation of mind. Irish immigrant and freed slave lived in radical hope of attainment of the good life. Radical hope reaches and acts for the best good even in the presence of unknown outcomes. Such hope intimates that human excellence remains possible and patient of education. Jesuit pedagogy would promote such excellence through promoting intellectual and moral formation. According to the catalog of the officers and students of Boston College, 1894 to 1895, the acquisition of knowledge, though it necessarily accompanies any right system of education, is a secondary result of education, not its end. Learning is an instrument of education, not its end. The end is culture, mental, and moral development. Thus a Jesuit education is oriented by and seeks to orient the whole person, 
mind and imagination, heart and soul. How does a Jesuit education accomplish this? By teaching virtue, by properly ordering appetite. Reasonable good conforms to rational appetite. To be unreasonable is to submit to, dis to disordered self-love. Or put differently, as Ignatius Loyola knew, Virtue may be taught by understanding and reverencing the unity of the human person. Each individual is to be recognized as a subject, responsible, independent, free, and capable of making her and his decisions, capable of finding God's will within. Thus, the familiar hallmarks of Jesuit education express that understanding and reverence, cura personalis, care for the individual person. Magis, the more, excellence in all endeavors to bring about the greater glory of God. Contemplation in action, reflection leading to gratitude, leading to service, leading to reflection. Reflection and discernment, wisdom, finding God in all things. Engaging the world with passion and delight. For the human person is a tender field of possibility to be cultivated for life for the good life, for eternal life. In the Catholic University as Promise and Project, Jesuit Michael Buckley critiqued the simplistic reduction of religion to morality. We here this afternoon would affirm his conclusion. Religion, theology, and ministry deserve and require proper rigorous research teaching and study. In some form or another, these three specializations have been part of the curriculum of Boston College almost since its inception. The earliest courses in the 19th century were not so much about theology, but rather about religion and its apologetics in an anti-Catholic context. In 1863, the Jesuit seminary still occupied the college buildings, and although in 1882 a scholastic was listed as studying theology privately, a seminary was never McElroy's intention. Still from the shadows of the university's history, two constituent schools emerge, the Weston School of Philosophy and a school of theology with pontifical approval to grant licentiate degrees. Each school had its own dean and faculty, each was academically and financially distinct one from another and from the college, although the university awarded its degrees. Predictably, friction over lines of authority and jurisdiction marred what Donovan calls an unusual and casual working arrangement. Finally, in 1968, these schools decamped to Cambridge. Yet it is interesting to learn that more than four decades earlier, Cardinal William O'Connell asked the university to organize a former summer school for religion teachers, in particular religious sisters. This perhaps precursor of the Institute for Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry thrived for a number of years and served hundreds of religious educators. In the light of these events, the joining of the 40-year-old IREPM with its intensive summer focus and Western Jesuit School of Theology in order to form the School of Theology and Ministry strikes a familiar note. The old has become new again. In the first quarter of the 20th century, who could have imagined the sight of hundreds of women and men, clerics, scholastic, lay, studying together theology with all the intellectual seriousness, passionate disinterest, and joy that higher education demands? In the middle of the 19th century, who could have imagined that women would take up pastoral ministry in the Roman Catholic Church? Who in the first 100 years of Boston College could have imagined that the university would welcome women faculty, lay and religious, to teach church history, theology, spirituality, and ministry to future priests? The great genius of the Catholic University has been its drive for unity and its reverence and simple humility before incomprehensible divine mystery. Here is Rainer Marie Rilke. 
I find you, Lord, in all things and in all my fellow creatures pulsing with life. As a tiny seed, you sleep in what is small, and in the vast, you vastly yield yourself. The drive for unity is made paradoxically concrete in the Jewish Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God. He is the impossible union of God and humanity, a pure active spirit, and what Deschardins called exuberant and holy matter. The Catholic University, Buckley writes, is, quote, a union of faith in all human culture. God becomes incarnate in humanity. Faith becomes incarnate in human culture, close quote. The incarnation, the scandalous engagement of God in history, changes forever our perception and reception of one another, of our world. For humanity is Christ's concern, neither merely nor incidentally. Humanity and the world are his concern comprehensively, completely. Thus, a Catholic university knows that nothing is foreign to it. It studies, touches, weighs, sifts, and teaches, scours and purifies all dross, engages all things good. In the Catholic university, theology prepares Christian intellectuals competent to interrogate the relation between the natural and supernatural ends of human living, to clarify the continuity and discontinuity of those ends, and to identify manifestations of the work of grace in human life, culture, and history. In the Catholic University, pastoral ministry as a critical praxis forms Christian intellectuals competent to assist human persons to negotiate the meaning of daily human life. Neither theology nor pastoral ministry substitute for empirical human science, but they may relieve science of its empirical burden. Human beings are much more than problems to be solved, much more than statistics to be counted and manipulated or analyzed, much more than a mass of howling needs, much more than biological drives, more than consumers. What theology and pastoral ministry study, announce, and pursue is the meaning and implications of the crucial message of the gospel, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, John 10, 10. Above all, the Catholic University holds and teaches Christ as the wisdom of God, the revelation of God, the power of God. All things are understood through him and on his terms, which are love and truth, mercy and justice. Christ is the example of what it means to live a fully human life, what it means to be a human being. This is what the Catholic University teaches. This is what our university teaches. This is the education for which immigrant Irish and freed slaves sought for their children and for themselves. Education for life, for the good life and virtuous life, for eternal life. Somehow, perhaps through grace, these humble peoples glimpse the basic horizon of human life. Somehow, perhaps through grace, these humble peoples grasp that the ascent of the soul towards God is not merely a private affair, but rather a personal function of an objective movement in that body of Christ, which takes over, transforms, and elevates every aspect of human life. As I was preparing this lecture, one night, I dreamt myself in John Burns' library. Someone led me, and a colleague, to an elaborately carved metal disc, a cover for an opening beneath the floor and filled with water. A well-muscled arm plunged in, drew out a rock, and presented it to my inspection. On the rock were carved a heart and a map of some sort with a prominent line chiseled to suggest a river. What might this dream suggest? Too much Harry Potter, a friend declared. <laughs> or perhaps too much Tolkien, too much Amos Tutuola, too much Ngugi Wationgo. Burns Library is the very heart of our university. Among its priceless and expanding collection, Burns holds, Burns holds a most prized treasure. The stories, sacred memories, and relics of the daughters and sons of Aaron. In Burns, tales and poems and sketches of Caribbean life find a home 
alongside original drawings of the Civil War. But Burns holds more. Burns Library guards the map to our varied, conflicting, different, differentiated, and intersecting pasts. With compass and light, we must follow that map to each other, cherish each other's feels. How else can we live in harmony? In this season of anniversaries, the lives and struggles and dilemmas which confronted Irish immigrant and freed slave, as well as John Baptist and James Healy speak to us, interrogate us, challenge us 21st century sons and daughters of Boston College. We are feels before each other. How can we live in harmony? So much for the map. What of the rock and the rough line of river carved across it? The river is not the Charles. It is neither the river Liffey nor the river Niger. Perhaps the river signifies our own personal journey, yours and mine, our love of learning, our desire for God, a rough line of river running along a seeker's course to find our true home. Boston College is our rock, our way station. Of the water, I am sure. Water heals, saves, and holds us in life. Water is life. The water can only be Christ, the living water, in whom we live and move and have our being. The one who soothes our restlessness, bathes our wounds, and slakes our thirst. Come, Christ invites us, drink. Those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. John 4:14. 4, For 150 years, Boston College has led us to this water. May our university lead those who shall come after us 150 years more. Thank you. Since this is, an, is, an, is not an argument, um, you may or may not have questions, or you may have uh, comments, or you may have some points of inquiry, and we're happy to entertain these uh, for a little while. or not, which is okay too. We've all had a frightful, you know, a few days. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> not a question. Would you just reflect further on education and emancipation and the coming together of these anniversaries? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there's so much to say. I mean, you could say, you could talk for a very long time. Um, well, um, education is such a prized, Historically, education is a prized achievement, and it still is today. It's just that it gets our attention is always drawn toward um, the refusal for education or the um, conditions under which uh, under which it occurs. But in the 19th century, this was so crucial to people. It was the gateway fundamentally uh, to freedom. Um, if you read slave narratives, I mean, people will say things, um, you know, like, you know, freedom is, is not what I thought it was. People are ill-equipped. In much the same way, although to some extent uh, more perversely so than the Irish immigrant. Um, the Irish immigrant had a, a memory um, of a life, of a home, especially the people who came uh, because of the famine. Um, and they had also the harrowing memory of watching the deterioration of all that. Um, they too endured enormous uh, prohibitions about education, the hedge schools, the penal laws. John McElroy was born just as some historians think the penal laws were coming to a close in the late 18th century, but other historians suggest it continued mm, quite, uh, quite a bit into the 19th century. So. <clears throat> 
in both instances, education means emancipation on this front, on the United States front. Um, this connection um, is, I think, uh, crucial to be rediscovered. I mean, there are ways in which um, the proliferation of programs in African and African diaspora studies or African American, whatever you want to call them, or area studies as they're called in some universities, uh, that proliferation looks really quite impressive as if we have in some ways come to uh, a, a kind of a conclusion that we're about to take on to a new uh, venture. But in fact, um, we may very well be in the position of having more books, as someone has pointed out, in our libraries than black students. And so books about black people and very few black people, which is a, which is, which is a very complex, I'm not trying to pretend that it's not complex, it's very complex. But I also think um, one of the key things about um, emancipation is that it reminds the country how important education is. That's number one. So you have your land-grant colleges, places like Howard and so on, or uh, Hampton University, Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it also uh, is crucial to remember um, a, f a friend and fellow parishioner of mine um, is fond of reminding us that in fact, we are a very new democracy since we only had full suffrage by 1965. So when you think of, when you think of the coercion uh, of, of people or the, and the prevention of the exercise of their rights, and it, it's, a, it's a continuing pattern for the way in which our country seems to behave. I mean, we all seem to suffer from nativism at one point or another. So, so because of that, I think uh, emancipation reminds us about the significance of democracy and how difficult a democracy is to maintain and, um, and how important it is to maintain a, a true democracy. Uh, so, so, I mean, this is not, there's a lot more to say. I mean, there's a lot more to say. Um, but I, I think that, that at least suggests a few, a few lines of, of reflection. Yeah. Thank you. If you would even go further with this in terms of the, uh, the task of um, theological schools like the theology school here and where you'd see the connection as it relates to theological education. Well, I mean, we're trying to, I, I asked someone, uh, I asked the, the librarians at Burns were very, very helpful to me. I'm very grateful to them. <clears throat> but I asked uh, someone how I could go about finding out who was the first black graduate of Boston College. And so nobody, everyone says, well, we didn't keep records then. So, so you got to find pictures. <laughs> but in fact, we do keep records. I mean, we do keep records. Um, we don't like to admit that we keep records, but we do. Uh, and there may, they may not be, historians will say, where you think the records are, they're someplace else. But the record is there. It's in someone's diary, it's in someone's letter to someone else, but the record is there. So theological schools, yes, okay. Um, the school, the, that there has always been some theological connection of preparation attached to Boston College, I found extraordinarily interesting. And it had all, it, it seems to have, and, and this is um, still sketchy, but and what, what I read was sketchy, I mean, it was just sketchy, but it would be interesting to, to read every one of those letters and the kind of agitation that went on among all the deans since there were three of them, the dean of the college, the dean of the school of philosophy, the dean of the school of theology, just trying to figure out what each one does. So, so, that, um, so that, that in itself is, is interesting. So in terms of the contemporary period, this is why I think these historical, these historical events are very crucial to us because it asks us, um, how do I face up to my own, uh, my own, my own present? And what is it that I could do differently that perhaps I have more of a scope, more of a, a larger field for action than perhaps BAPS may have had? Or a larger field for action than perhaps, um, I think his name is, his name is Deveni, I think, who is the first uh, dean of the School of uh, Weston, uh, School of Theology, School of Theology. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Theological schools with Protestant students, African-American Protestant students, are filled 
uh, and filled means you know there are five people in the school. But but we are we are cherry uh, here. Uh, I don't mean necessarily or exclusively Boston College, but Catholics. We Catholics are cherry in the way in which we go about thinking about who belongs to us, which is why I purposefully wanted to weave these people together because they have so much in common. And their 20th century interactions are so bad and have been so bad. Um, if we could remember that we all endured the very same things in history, um, we, would, we would be much, much more aware that we are feels before each other that we are, in some ways, raising always the question of how we might live together in truth and harmony and justice. When I was a graduate student here, <clears throat> um, the pilot, along with another newspaper, did an incredible um, display of cartoons in which um, there were caricatures which replaced black images for Irish images, Irish images for black images. All you did was fill in the color of the, the skin, but it was the same bumbling, you know, sort of guy with the, the torn collar and the, just to make, you know, the same kind of vicious caricature. That sort of thing is educational, I think, because it teaches us that, that in some ways there's always someone that we, we place to the edge of society. We're doing it now in terms of the way in which we deal with immigrants. Um, none of us are, are, harbor, are interested in um, aiding and abetting illegal, illegal immigrants, undocumented workers. On the other hand, when we look at the ways in which people have suffered to come to the United States, both in the past and in the present, it behooves us to pay clo more close attention to, to that situation and to how our own ancestors arrived here. If we would do that, we might have, um, we might, we might irrigate our own hearts a little more, you know. Sean, first a self-interested um, plug for the STM. The um, I'm proud to say that the STM currently uh, has a quarter of all of its students as international students. Yes. And a big uh, percentage of those are students of color. So yes, I'm proud to say that uh, we now hold, not that we've made, the, made good on the promise, but the STM is working very hard to address the very questions you've, uh, questions that have been implicit in Boston College's History. sort of promise yeah. from the beginning. Yes. Uh, my question has more to do with um, John McGreevy's great book, which you quote, Catholicism and American Freedom. And in his chapter on the Elliott School Rebellion, which is a very famous yes. anti-Catholic episode in Boston, he talks about the fact, uh, he, he's speculating on why Irish Catholics, or Catholics who themselves have been the the subject of such persecution in the United States were not the leaders of emancipation, but rather Protestants. It was the Protestant leaders of people like Robert Gould Shaw, sure. uh, who himself is not an unproblematic character. But, no, not yeah. at all. But, but, and he speculates. But he did go to Fordham. He did go to Fordham. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. There's a big statue to it. Um, but he says that maybe perhaps that at the time Catholicism was more committed to a priestly understanding of Christianity and that, and that Boston Protestantism, especially Unitarianism, was very prophetic. Do you see anything in the current stance, since we're also celebrating this year the anniversary of Vatican II, that perhaps the church itself is perhaps at a different place? Wow. That's you can answer a, any part of that you want or okay, not. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, first of all, I think uh, one of the points that he makes, that McGreevy makes, is that most, certainly for a long period of time, abolitionists were anti-Catholic, which accounts for uh, the hesitancy. Uh, why would you expose yourself? But <clears throat> once you became someone, I mean, of the stature, let's say, of Andrew Carney, who really bailed McElroy out of debt time and time again, um, and who, who was such, an, such a friend of the university, such a friend of the university as it, at the college as it, as it was growing. But um, it seems, um, and this is where O'Connell becomes so important because he's done so much for European uh, suffrage and um, liberty and democracy, and so that critique of Irish tolerance of slavery um, is, is pretty hefty, uh, pretty hefty. Um, Vatican II, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things I would say, back to your concern about 
uh, the internationalization of the School of Theology and Ministry, I think that that is really remarkable, and I think it's really to be admired. At the same time, um, I look at that internationalization, and I see absences uh, in, our, in our home. That is, in, in the United States, I see, I see absent people. So that's a question for me. It's not a criticism. It's just a question, how do we, it's, it's, it's uh, Professor Pineda Madrid's question, uh, how do we do better? Um, where, are, where are the people? Um, Vatican II, I don't know. Uh, we are committed, aren't we? At least we seem to be struggling over the commitments of the church to whether a style of ministry in which we return to a very, um, what, confirmed clerical style, um, or whether we, we feel comfortable with um, something that, that is so different. Uh, but the difference, of course, is what we've had for the last 50 years. And so the repudiation of that by people who've only known that, uh, and on the one hand, psychologically, as, as human psychological uh, you know, uh, comments would say, or, or psychologists would tell us, makes sense. I mean, this is the kind of thing, thing that happens. But um, one wonders whether or not people are aware of what's at stake. In, in that kind of embrace. Because it, it, it impl it's not just something surface. Um, that's, that's the whole point. It's not just something surface. Anybody can put on something, any priest can put on something and go say the Tridentine Mass, okay. But there is something else going on there and that I would think has to be addressed. And it has implications for how we live together as a church. It has implications for ecclesial, for ecclesial community. On the other hand, one could say that the question really is almost, um, what, I want to say uh, moot. Um, the, the dwindling number of clerics um, forces all of us to um, ask questions about how, how, do we be, how do we understand ourselves as a sacramental church? What does it mean to be a sacramental church if I have no access to the sacraments? And this is a, this is a crucial, uh, it's a crucial, I think, issue. I would also turn it around and say, how daring to deprive God of contact with God's own people. How daring to do that. Uh, how daring to interrupt the communion between God and God's own people by suggesting that because we have no X, we can no longer do, do Y. Uh, that seems to me to be, um, a rather strange for people who insist on their reverence and their, uh, their awe and their commitment before incomprehensible divine mystery. That's not really an answer to your question on the one hand. Um, thank you. <laughs> I went to Boston College. <laughs> yes, oh great, you've got the microphone. Dr. Copeland, as a <clears throat> scholar of emancipation. Could you encapsulate in the interests of time your views of President Lincoln during that uh, trying period and his faith that you talked about, not his, but faith and its impact on our society, on education, especially higher education. Um, what impact, especially in the light of all the scholarship emerging this past decade about Lincoln, mm -hmm. um, the impact his views and principles and courage have had long term upon religion in our society. And secondly, the other principle you addressed, uh, that of hope that he demonstrated so uh, humanely and humanly, uh, the impact that has had upon our culture in this country. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a very good question and it's a very difficult one. Um, like many people, many scholars, I'm in two minds about Lincoln. I mean, in some ways, Lincoln has the view that most Catholics had. We want to preserve the Union, but we're not so sure about slavery, whether or not we should abolish it. So if you place emancipation, the actual act, in, um, in that that sort of uh, sphere, its purpose is to really save the Union. And in fact, um, all enslaved people are not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Um, it frees slaves in the Confederate states, but not those held in Union states. That in itself presents us with an anomaly. Um, and yet, and yet, um, Lincoln's ability to negotiate um, really, uh, I mean, he's a, he, he was a very, he's a very controversial figure and he's a very, he's a lightning rod for almost everybody. Um, enslaved people understood him as really the liberator, the emancipator. Um, if you would ask, this is the ordinary enslaved people, if you would ask someone like Frederick Douglass, he would, although he would not have been an ordinary enslaved people by the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, he was a fugitive slave who lived part of the time here in, uh, in Boston, who was a friend of Garrison, who published his own newspaper. But, but Douglass gives us some insight into, in fact, what the abolitionist strategy is. At one point, uh, they're sending Douglas around to different states, and uh, he's giving his talk, and they say to him, you sound too learned. You don't sound like a slave. And he's really, uh, he's really shocked at this because he thought these people were his friend. He's seeking to cultivate himself. He realizes his disadvantages, and, and he had some help so he's trying very hard to do this. I think I, I could say that in some ways, Lincoln's interest is the Union. He says at one point, if I could save the Union without freeing the Negro, I would do that. But, but, um, but, he, but he does it, and it becomes uh, an important and incredible act that really, in a certain sense, saves democracy. It really does. I mean, it, it, you could say it. it, it in fact, um, there was a young man here uh, last week um, who is a Harvard philosophy graduate who was a comedian. He's African American, and he he talked about his grandfather being a slave. He said, "My grandfather was a was a slave up until 1880," and he said, "If you're blinking, that's because you have to tell people." that emancipation has happened. And if you're in some places, no one told people. In some ways, uh, and, and that's not the only example I've come across myself personally, in some ways, emancipation is a very, it, it's a, it is a blow for democracy. It's a blow for union. It, it's not a blow for the slaves. That's the problem with it. But without it, we would be in far worse trouble. In a certain sense, it's the lesser of two evils, which is not really a good, a good choice. The, the thing about hope, though, in some ways, Lincoln is inspired. So the second inaugural, the better angels of our nature and so on. And everyone says this, every politician says this at one point, that as a people, I, I hesitate to say community, but as a, as, a, as a people, the American people somehow, some way, stumble toward an understanding of something that's really far beyond us and we make, we make a thrust for it. I think in this sense, um, that's emancipation from the other side, from the side of people who do not need emancipation but who are certainly affected by it. Um, so hope, in a certain way, yes, it's, it's, not, it's not optimism. I'm not talking about optimism in this, in this, this paper at all. I'm talking about real hope against hope because most of the people who were hoping for freedom and who wanted education for their children all died in slavery. They had no hope of, of ever. I mean, think of it, you know, you, you're here, it's 1638, you're still in slavery, your children, if you have them, are enslaved. And here, we're, we're waiting till, eight, till 1863. So that's, that's what, 300 plus years? So, so you, you have to have hope for that. And here's where religion becomes, in, in fact, a movement for hope. It can't be, uh, it can never be, theologically speaking, that kind of hope can never be self-abnegation, that I deserve my enslavement, or I deserve, I deserve this. It can't, it can't be that. It has to be something else, which is why Christianity, that enslaved people became Christian is a, in a certain sense is a real miracle. You could say that about Boston College. That it exists is a miracle. 
This is the first thing that Donovan, Dunnigan, and Fitzgerald want to tell us, that given the, given the situation here, it's absolutely in, in, improbable. Uh, it's impossible that there could have ever been a college like this. Not here. Worcester's another story. It's far from the prying eyes, College of the Holy Cross in central Massachusetts, but in the heart of Brahmin, Boston. Um, so so I, think, I think you're, you're, you're putting your finger on what's, what's important here in terms of hope. So a religion that cultivates hope has to do so in such a way that it does not diminish or truncate its eschatological orientation, but neither does it allow that orientation to displace life here on earth. So there has to be something, this is, this is again, this is why it's astonishing that, that any black people in the United States, descendants of enslaved people, would be Christian. Because Christianity gets used against, against you in this, in this format. Um, I'm going to stop, but that, I mean, that's probably more than, but I, I don't know if I hit all, hit, at least I hope I hit two or three crucial points that you were thinking about or you're puzzling over yourself and thinking this. It's a good time to think about these things, actually, over the course of the year. It's a good time to do that. There are some very good, uh, good things around, actually, now. I mean, for instance, um, Henry Louis Gates has a little collection of Lincoln and slavery, which includes a number of documents and uh, letters and so on, which, which, is a, which, is a, which would be a good thing to, to, to reflect on. It would be a good thing to reflect on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if anybody else in the room had an internal gasp when they heard about the three brother priests who did nothing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I did. And, but as I was hearing you talk about it later, I thought, well, yeah, protecting fragile Boston College, a real conflict for them. And I just see a parallel uh, as a Catholic woman. <laughs> you know, every day I have people asking me in one way or another, why? And as, as a graduate of Western Jesuit School of Theology, as a professional in ministry, and as a practicing Roman Catholic female. So I guess I just wonder if you'd like to speak to that conflict, because there are days when people blame me and worse, you know, brother priests for hanging around in this situation and not speaking out. But if you speak out too much, you lose your job, you can't do good, you can't save what you have. So I just throw that out there as a topic. You can always do good. <laughs> and you know that. You can always do good. Even, even if it hurts, you can always do good. And most of the time, in fact, it does hurt. Um, yeah, the, the three priests are really fascinating, the Healy brothers. Um, once they left, uh, their father was an amazing man. Um, O'Toole is brilliant on this uh, in Passing for White. Um, uh, it's, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent book. Um, uh, James Augustine Healy was an auxiliary, was, was Bishop of Portland, Maine. Um, he did not look black. If, you could, if there could be such a thing as not looking black. Um, passing for him was not too difficult. Neither was it too difficult for Patrick, who was the Jesuit, who was, who was once a president of Georgetown. And uh, Sherwood, on the other hand, it was a little bit more difficult for him. But by dint of personality and intelligence, Sherwood, um, O'Toole has this phrase, induced in white people a kind of colorblindness. It's very interesting. Um, but uh, but they, uh, they were here, they were in Boston. They had a home in Boston. The last surviving, there were 10 of them. One died in, uh, as an infant. Um, and uh, once their parents had died, um, they, never went, they never went south again. After they came here, they came to Holy Cross because Michael Morris Healy was on business in the north. Very affluent by today's, you know, 30, 300, what is it? $34,000 or $35,000 is not that much money in a certain sense today. But in that economy, it would have been close to something like a quarter of a million dollars, almost, you know, so, or, or a little bit better. And so he, he really, he was very entrepreneurial. They had a working farm. And when he met uh, Fitzpatrick on a train, he uh, learned about College of the Holy Cross, and he sent his sons there. They all went, all four of them. 
um, three of them became priests. The Jesuits, a friend of mine asked me, how did they do this? Because you'd have to talk about people's parentage. Well, the Jesuits were very, uh, very good about this. They figured out how to uh, draw on an old uh, sort of uh, custom in which certain families, uh, if they were prominent enough, particularly royalty, uh, a child out of that sort of marriage could be ordained. You could just kind of not, not attend to it. And, um, and O'Toole's very good. He, he really, he, he tracks everything down so well and, and tells such an incredible story. But, uh, but they, uh, yeah, it, somehow it worked. It's, it's astonishing, but it worked. And, and it, what's interesting is that it's, you see how people can choose not to ask certain questions or respond in certain ways. It's a choice, just as behaving the other way is a choice. It's a choice. It's not a, uh, it's not a haphazard or a native or natural response. It's a learned behavior. Um, both of them were very valuable to the Archdiocese of Boston. And um, Patrick Healy, when he died, had erected over his uh, grave a Celtic cross. That's how he saw himself as Irish Catholic. Um, it, it's really quite, it's, it's, it is disappointing in, in the world in which we live because of what identity means to us, and in some ways, what it's been foisted on us, too. I mean, there's a certain way in which you can construct your own identity. They did that, and, and so in this sense, it's a very modern, if you will, strategy. But, but it leaves them with no prophetic response to the whole situation all around them. Um, I mean, you know, they, they really, they're fascinating. Okay, so women, in a certain sense, um, yes, we have, in a certain way, become outliers in the church to some extent, which is unfortunate. And to say it's unfortunate is kind of a namby-pamby thing to say. But in fact, um, the, the way in which we might think of this, I guess, is that we know about that because Jesus knows about that, what it means to be an outlier in your society, um, what it means to be without power, and what it means to still do as much good as you can. I think the, the, the challenge is the prophetic. And some of us are called to it, not all of us are. And I think, I think learning how to live with that is really very important. Because no one really wants to be a prophet. Everyone keeps saying, well, I want to be prophetic. Well, once you're up on the cross, you know, you're sort of figuring out, how did I get here? You know? <laughs> well, by being prophetic. You know? So in a certain sense, you've got to figure out how to, um, to do what is right and good in, in the best possible way without dent of loss of integrity, which becomes so important, I think, so important for us, you know. Yeah, thank you for your ministry, really, you know. I mean, there are people in this room who I keep trying to get to be the pastoral associate of my parish, you know. <laughs> it's not working, but I'm trying. <laughs> I think she'd be real good. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's take this our last question, and then I'm sure people have, you have work to do. <laughs> Professor, I was hoping you could uh, expand on uh, one point of your answer to Dean Massa's uh, question, which was um, when talking about the, the solid uh, internationalization of the student body at the STM, you mentioned a uh, a lack at home. I was wondering if you could expand on that and how a, a school of theology can take that seriously. Well, this what I'm saying in, in a very polite way is like, gee, why can't we recruit any African American students? That's all I'm saying. You know, there there actually are some that are out there that are recruitable, and um, I think I think it's also a very complex problem because um, in a certain way. This is a community that has had some new incursions for evangelization. I'm thinking this as I'm talking to you because um, I'm thinking about just Boston here right now. And I'm thinking, what's the Catholic high school um, that African American students could go to? And uh, there are some, but I'm thinking, OK, where is it? And where would it be in an atmosphere which would cultivate an interest in theology or religion, what, where would that be? For instance, if I think of the city in which I was born, Detroit, um, there is no Catholic high school except for the University of Detroit within the city of Detroit, within the city limits of Detroit. 
when I was a high school student there, there were at least, you know, 15, you know. So, okay, we can't sustain 15, that's fine. They're not five, you know. They're not three, there's one. So the chances of anybody really being interested in ministry are not going to happen until they're perhaps, you know, on a second career. And by then, on a second career, you've got a family, possibly, or you've got, you know, there, or there's someone in your life. I mean, there's, there's, there's got to be some kind of change that you've got to make. Somebody has to come with you, you know, give up what they're doing to come and watch you be in school. I mean, there, there are a lot of choices that, 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 um, that lay ministry provokes. They're not bad choices. I mean, thousands of people do it every day all around us, all around us. There are plenty of people uh, in ministry at Old South Church at New, you know, Newton Baptist Church and, you know, whatever down in uh, Newton Center or whatever, you know, Church of the Advent, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever stripe you've got, there are plenty of Protestant lay people um, and plenty of Protestant ministers who are married who, who are managing in some way or another to do very good ministry. I mean, these abolitionists were not, uh, were not uh, unmarried people. You know, Garrison had a family. Um, you know, so the women were in a less, uh, less uh, easy situation, neither Sojourner Truth nor Mariah Stewart. Where Mariah Stewart's husband died. Um, but, but um, you know, Frederick Douglass had a wife. Um, David Walker seems to be unmarried. He was a great pamphleteer up on Beacon Hill. I mean, there's a, there, Boston, in a certain sense, is a very rich city. It brings together so many people. It does what a seaport city does. It does what a seaport city does. And we have an opportunity in this way to meet each other, but we, well, we spend a lot of time clashing. You know, a lot of time cla- my, my point is just for what you're saying is really, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity that we could learn from. And let me say it for true. We, we already have a married clergy in the Catholic Church. We already have a married clergy. We have Episcopal priests who have joined us with their families. And so we already have a married clergy. So why it pertains to some people or not is, you know, we're not able to decide that. You, you know, here and now, you and I, anyway, are not able to decide that because um, we're not in charge of anything. But uh, the last time I checked. But, but I think, seriously, if we would face up to that, we could begin to see that this is not such an egregious paradigm. It's not such a strange paradigm. The first pope had a wife, you know. It's, it's, not such a, it's not such an egregious paradigm. And if we put God before ourselves, we might even be a little bit more concerned about how we behave. You know? Okay, so thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Sean for the wonderful discussion.